Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to you, Dr. Chikipix, <laughs> who is in California. Uh, we are here for the seventh uh, geography webinar that used to be called the Philippine Geographical Society. Uh, wait a minute, I made a mistake. Sorry about that. Redo. This, we're actually in a geography webinar, and uh, it used to be known as the um, uh, Brown Bag Colloquium Series. And um, this is co-sponsored with the Philippine Geographical Journal Lecture Series. And we're here to uh, listen to the discussion today of uh, Dr. Linda Kikivics, um, who I went to grad school with in UNC Chapel Hill. But first, let me tell you first about the rules before I call on Dr. Kikivics. Please uh, keep your microphones on mute to avoid unnecessary background noise during our discussion and session. Um, the lecture is simultaneously streamed at the UP Department of Geography, the YouTube channel. So those of you who doesn't want to be captured by that, you can just turn off your camera. Otherwise, please turn on your camera just, just for a speaker. The other one is uh, you may send your questions via Zoom or chat box. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can also do the same on YouTube. And we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Di Guzman who will be able to get to your questions and bring them here if you're watching it in real time. And finally, the session will be recorded for documentation purposes. So let me introduce to you uh, uh, Dr. Linda Kikivics, or Kiki as she is known uh, when we went to uh, grad school together. Um, she uh, obtained her PhD under Alpha Gravy in geography at UNC Chapel Hill. The dissertation uh, is on uh, Palestine mapping or the political mapping of Palestine 2012. After that, she went to uh, the critical global humanities at the Brown University's Kogat Center as a postdoc. And while we were in grad school, she actually got a certificate for the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. Uh, the talk is based on her dissertation research, which, which produced two articles. And uh, some of you may have a chance to see it in our announcement. The Art of War, Art of Resistance, Palestinian Counter Cartography on Google Earth uh, for the Annals of the American uh, Association of Geographers, which came out in 2014, and the other one, uh, When the Carob Tree Was the Border, on Autonomy and Palestinian Practices of Figuring It Out. This came out in 2013 at this publication called Capitalism, Nature, and Socialism. I would also like to, to acknowledge that this uh, webinar is also sponsored by the Mapping Geonarratives uh, Initiative, as well as the Geography uh, 292 class that I'm teaching this semester called Cultures of Mapping and Counter Cartography. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda Kikivex. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, can I get a thumbs up to see if you're able to hear me okay and see me okay? Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to be sharing some slides with you. A uh, very uh, brief presentation it'll be about 25 or 30 minutes to talk a little bit about uh, my work with uh, uh, the with uh, my dissertation research and then what happened after as i had built on uh, i'm also now writing a book about it for a more popular audience uh, that i'm happy to talk about and and that is more about my personal process in learning about israel when i was young and then learning about how israel was created and being very heartbroken about it when I was older and how that led me to do this work. But for now, what I'll do is I'll present to you, if that's okay with everyone, uh, a very brief PowerPoint presentation that kind of gives a 101 background on Israel-Palestine and uh, a little sneak peek into the work that I did, which uh, uh, Dr. Palace Joseph, great friend, um, gesture to in those uh, couple of articles that I published. So I'm going to share my screen and I just want to make sure it uh, looks all right for folks. How is that? Yes, excellent. Uh, so most of the time uh, when, when, when you're a student of Israel, Palestine, most conversations begin in the 19th century, whether it's where, Na where Napoleon goes to the Middle East 
or when Jews start fleeing Europe because of persecution and moving into Palestine. And what I do is a little bit different and I, I push history back a little bit more because as I was learning about Palestine, Israel, I started to see a lot of similarities from with other processes, colonial processes around the world. So I begin with 1492, but of course you, we can begin at any moment and depending on when we begin, uh, we, will, we, we will come up uh, with a different offering, a different lens onto what's happening there. So I begin in 1492 and I, I think it's really fascinating and of no small consequence that after Columbus's uh, quote unquote discoveries of the Americas in 1492, and, and he was going on behalf of Spain, immediately uh, Spanish kingdoms and the Portuguese kingdoms start to fight over who's going to get to colonize those areas. And we start to see then the Pope stepping in because now you have these two countries that uh, are Catholic and they're not supposed to be fighting. And so when what the Pope does, and a lot of us learn this, um, I remember I learned it in high school, but I didn't think it was that important, but now I do. <laughs> the This line that the Pope drew uh, that divided the world into two over uh, anything east of that line, Portugal was allowed to colonize. So here is, uh, this is why um, part of this, part of uh, the Americas, Brazil speaks Portuguese and so much of Africa was colonized and a lot of Asia as well by the Portuguese. And then anything west of that line was allowed to be colonized by Spain, which is why so much of the Americas speaks Spanish. And it was really important because what that did was it inaugurated this idea that the world could be, that the world was now one, there was more knowledge about what the world looked like and that it could be cut up into a pie or into pieces of objects for ownership at this global scale. And so then what we get for um, the world is now with modern borders, in, on political geography maps, we get these lines that are these products of these cuts that that treat land as objects of, of property, of um, external control. So here we have a Middle East and North Africa. I'm just gonna zone into where we're gonna be talking about today. Um, here's the Middle East and North Africa, circa 2000s, you start seeing these borders, but it was really fascinating to me uh, is that these borders are so new and actually they're quite new all over the world. And uh, before these borders existed in this area, we had uh, the Ottoman Empire, which extended out this way and those borders didn't exist. There was more like um, the territories that were really important included the sea routes. So the Black Sea, the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea because those were really important trade routes when shipping was was very prominent and important at the time. And uh, this is the area I'm highlighting here of where we're gonna look in where Palestine's at. Uh, and then we see that Palestine got its borders in 1923, which was right after the end of World War I, the Ottoman Empire had fallen. And so then Europe was deciding who was going to get what, and it decided by making these cuts on maps. And so just as an example of why uh, those territories were going to be so important, uh, Europe at this time in the 19th century uh, was now very powerful and the Ottoman Empire was falling. And so then this posed a really important question for the European powers is when the Ottoman territories fall, now that so much of the rest of the world has been colonized by those European powers and Great Britain was the most powerful, but Germany was eyeing these areas, Russia was eyeing, and so was France, because you had these really two important uh, uh, routes between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea and between the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea. And so what the Eastern question was, is how is it that uh, the, the power balance or imbalance in Europe is going to change once the Ottoman Empire falls, who's gonna get what? And so, uh, as an example of what happens is uh, Napoleon uh, goes to war with Britain, but because he's so afraid of Britain's navy, 
he turns his warships over to uh, Egypt, Palestine, and that's the, that's when we start getting the first modern maps of the area. But what I mean about modern maps is these scientifically measured maps that can be replicable, uh, where they're not sketches, for example, but they're they're triangulated in um, a coordinate system. And so then you start getting these maps, largely of Egypt. So if you're an anthropologist or if you study anthropology, then you you hear about the Encyclopedia of Egypt being very important, and that's where you know his science, the scientists that Napoleon took, start you know uh, talking about the flora and the fauna and the pyramids and all of that of Egypt. And in the mapping sheets, here you get what uh, this mapping sheet of the of the Encyclopedia of Egypt looked like, and and just putting um, Palestine on there, it just so happened that. Um, uh, uh, Palestine then eventually starts getting a lot of attention because so much of what was understood as the quote unquote holy land for Christians in Europe was now finally opened up again, which it hadn't been accessed since the Crusades. And so immediately you start getting a claim, especially from very conservative evangelical Christians over, over this quote unquote holy land. And they use science to map out the, the truth of their specific interpretation of the Bible, which they were interpreting it now as a literal document rather than as an allegorical uh, piece of literature that could really help with moral questions. The, the, the Bible was now being read as a very literal historical document. And so from that, they start getting the, the borders of the promised land according to the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. And we start getting then the first lines of, of what Palestine would look like. And it would be from this confluence of religious, uh, imperial and scientific uh, in, uh, imperatives that we would get this map because it was religious scholars that wanted to make this map, but they actually didn't have the tools to make it. They needed to deploy the, um, the British engineering office, which was a military office in order to do it. And it was really great for the British because they were able to use religious religion and science as a cover to go into those territories and map them because they were still under the Ottoman Empire. And in the 1870s, this map was completed and uh, several, a few decades later, it would prove very useful for the British to defeat the Ottoman Empire. And when the Ottoman Empire was then defeated, we start getting uh, claims to those areas. Here is a, a section of the Ottoman Empire that contains the areas that we now know as like Iraq, Syria, Kuwait. And um, this is a secret map that was leaked in, in uh, it was made in 1916 by the British and the French and the Russians about once the Ottoman Empire falls, who's going to get what? And it, a very interesting story about it is that um, it was supposed to be a secret map because on the ground, the British and the French were promising the, the, in, the indigenous inhabitants that they would get autonomy, that they would get their own self-determination. But in secret, what the British and the French were doing was really just using the people on the ground to defeat the Ottomans and then deciding that they were going to cut up the areas so that they can own it. And that's called the Sykes-Picot map. Uh, Russia was part of it, but very soon after you'd get the Russian Revolution and the revolutionaries found this map and leaked it to the world about what the Russian Empire had been up to with the British and the French. And this is not at all unique in the world. Uh, very, uh, just a few decades before, we saw this idea of cutting up uh, the world in, in Africa. This is uh, the partition of Africa where th that took place in Europe among the European powers, literally laying out a map on a table and deciding who, which European power was going to get what. And um, before that, so this is the late 19th century, but even before that, in the 18th century, we already had this logic at play um, in the Americas with the carving out of the new world between the Spanish and the Portuguese. Um, and, and so then you start getting these lines. 
But then going back over then to the Sykes-Picot agreement, we start seeing that Palestine was supposed to be under British, French, and Russian protection. You can see it there in the dark red or orange. And, um, uh, and, and it, was, it was at play because there were so, Palestine has the holy sites that are very important to all three monotheistic religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and so it was really difficult to, to, to have one country lay claim to it. And so then when you learn about Israel-Palestine, this is usually where it begins at now this point, the Sykes-Picot agreement. You don't really get the background like how I just gave about the, part, the, the scramble for Africa and its partition, and what preceded that was the partition of the Americas. And then what preceded that was this new, new global linear thinking that was inaugurated with 1492. Uh, so then what you get usually is you begin with the Sykes-Picot Agreement sometimes. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, you start the, the beginning of, of, of politics becomes these borders. So then what happens is that the idea that borders should exist and that's the way that society should organize politically just becomes a given as if it's an ahistorical thing, as if borders have always been around uh, uh, with us forever. The idea of the nation state has been with us forever. Uh, that usually doesn't go critiqued uh, among either Palestinians or Israelis. And so here we have the British mandates borders and, and the British took over Palestine calling it a mandate because the word colonialism was now really going out of style. So they didn't wanna use that word, a British colony. So um, they called it a mandate, but it was the same thing. It was, it was the idea that the local population was not mature enough or sophisticated enough to govern themselves. So Britain would take them under their wing. And when Britain decided that they were ready to have their own country, then they would have their own country. Uh, you get also then um, in Europe uh, at this time, and especially when this idea of the nation state starts to arise in these previous, in the previous century, in the 19th century, you get a, a, a massive problem within Europe and they start talking about like, well, we're going to make France, we're going to make Germany, we're going to make Italy, but what does it mean to be French? You know, so you have this problem of the idea now that you, there's no longer a monarchy and the people are going to rule, there's a problem over the definition of well, what do we mean by the people? And so then there's this drive to create a more homogenous type of people that live within that container inside those borders of the new nation state. And so then being different from that idea of what the nation is, uh, put a lot of people at risk for persecution and Jews faced a lot of that. And so there was a lot of anti-Semitism taking place in Europe. And so there was a lot of debate among Jews in Europe over how they were going to respond. Many decided to assimilate uh, and create reform Judaism that was, you know, they weren't going to look different. They weren't really gonna act different. They're gonna be more liberal. Uh, to, to change with the times. Others moved more toward orthodoxy and wanted to insist on their difference. And others uh, wanted to have a more international kind of movements with labor uh, all over the world, not just the Jewish struggle, but an international worker struggle. And then others thought about this idea of creating a nation state for Jews, which is the idea of Zionism. Uh, where Jews could be the majority in a place where they hadn't been able to be before. Um, and so then they decided that they would settle, the Zionist movement decided that it would be in Palestine. And so uh, after, it doesn't really get a lot of traction, it gets some traction, but it gets more traction after World War II and the tragedy of the Holocaust, where now the world was able to see these horrors and so then the United Nations, which had just been recently created, decided that they were going to split Palestine, cut Palestine into, into three pieces. The yellow would be for the native population, uh, the Arab state. The orange would, would be for the, the new Jewish state. And then the purple area is where Jerusalem and Bethlehem are. 
would be a more international zone. And what this meant for the native population, the Palestinians, is that anybody who, was land, who would land or who the border would land on top of them and they were in the Jewish state area would then have to leave and then move over to the Arab areas, which happened a lot like with population transfer between India and Pakistan. So this was like the logic of the time. And of course, the native population completely refused and neighboring countries and new countries of, uh, of Jordan and Egypt and Syria went to war on behalf of the native population of Palestine with against Israel. Um, but the new state of Israel was being armed by the West. And so Israel was victorious. And what ended up happening after the war is that a state of Israel was created, but a state of Palestine was not. And what happened is that in those areas where the state of Israel was created, about seven to 800,000, even more Palestinians had to, uh, they fled and Israel never allowed them to come back. And so they moved into refugee camps in what becomes the area known as the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, uh, Jordan and Syria and Lebanon. And um, they've been in refugee camps ever since, even to this day, they're still there. Uh, but this isn't the last war. There was another war that took place almost two decades later, and it was uh, the Six Day War and Israel was victorious one more time and it took more land. It took the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank and the Golan Heights from Syria and immediately began to settle those areas with more Jews. And the idea was always to try to get more Jews to live there and to just create facts on the ground where now you would have an ordinary everyday life, Jews living there, creating their lives and uh, to make it difficult for anyone to remove them from those new settlements. Uh, eventually you get Israel uh, isolating the Palestinians more and more from their neighbors and the Camp David Treaty, which returned the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt in exchange for Egypt to make itself neutral, or at least um, at least neutral, or or for Israel in this in this in this war, uh, made it so that uh, Egypt was no longer going to fight on the side of the Palestinian movement, and uh, it would get the Sinai Peninsula back, and also the United States would give Egypt the Egyptian government a lot of money, and maintain the peace. Um, Gaza, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights would remain occupied and they're still occupied to this day. In the 1990s, um, you get the peace process. Uh, you have an uprising in 1987 in the West Bank and Gaza, and that makes uh, Israel have a massive PR crisis on its hand because the world starts to see that Israel isn't really a victim. It's got these massive tanks, a lot of military weapons, and it's going up against a defenseless population that's just it only has stones to throw at tanks. And so then um, the idea, uh, Israel then decides to engage in a peace process and recognize that Palestinians um, uh, exist, that Israel was created by, uh, by trying to empty Israel out of non-Jews. And so then the idea with the peace process was to create two states. An, uh, Israel and then a Palestine. And Palestine was supposed to be a state with the West Bank and Gaza with some kind of corridor in between. Um, and there was a lot of euphoria about it, even though it was extremely controversial on the, from the perspective of the refugees, because all of the refugees who had lived in what is now Israel, what had been Palestine, continued to insist that they were going to go back to their villages and they have international law that said that they would. And, but Israel has just never allowed it. And so usually like when you get into a studying Israel-Palestine, what you see is a series of maps like this, um, where Palestine is shrinking and Israel continues expanding. And um, the peace process is now, it has been pretty much dead in the water for a really, really long time because even though the Palestinian leadership agreed to a two-state solution where they would have Gaza and the West Bank, which was a very small part of all of Palestine, Israel still has not this has not uh, uh, declared where its actual borders are. It's it's one of the only countries in the world 
that, that has not declared its official borders. And it continues building Jewish settlements in areas of the West Bank and also the Golan Heights, which makes it then really difficult, not impossible to even conceive of what a Palestine state would look like if it's going to be contiguous the way that other nation states are, because it's just a bunch of like um, cantons now, like these small bits of, of pieces, especially in the West Bank, uh, where uh, there's just settlements that are just surrounding uh, Palestinian villages. So uh, some uh, a framework that I that I bring into this is the idea that this is a logic that is actually not unique, even if it's it has its specificities in Israel-Palestine, it's not unique. And it comes from a logic And here. I have a diagram in the world of 1492. It created that line, the idea of lines where you could cut up the world into, into objects for ownership. Um, but only Europeans were allowed to cut the world up in that way, because what the, the greater cut that was made with the, with, the, with the creation of the modern world, the world that we live in now with that logic that has been imposed on the globe, is the idea that there is a non-Europe and there is a Europe. And that division was important because Europe was creating itself as well. And, uh, and there, was, there was a lot of fighting within Europe, and Europe wanted to create a, a peaceful existence for itself. And it did that how? It did that by exporting out any like lawlessness over to non-Europe and creating like, international law and gentlemen's agreements, laws of war within Europe. So Europe was supposed to be the space of peace where even if there was war, at least there, there was laws of war. There was supposed to be like a civilized manner in the way that people reacted. And uh, in non-Europe, you can go do pirates, you can go be a pirate over there, you can go steal everybody's stuff, you can go kill, and it didn't matter because um, it, uh, international law didn't, didn't apply there. But then, and this lasted for several centuries until you get, um, in particular, the creation of the League of Nations and the, the United Nations, which comes from resistance in the colonies against col uh, colonialism. You get the the world of universal human equality, uh, but now you have this problem of who is a human, uh, and Europe has a really hard time respecting difference and needs to, and because there's so much at stake, if you're going to give the, uh, the idea of a human that much power in the world, then then for Europeans, they're like, well, you need, we need to figure out what do we mean by the human, uh, and, and that continued to be the the, the more European, the white, the Christian, the uh, heteronormative uh, kind, of, kind of being. Uh, and then any, anyone against the, that project was considered non-human. So this is um, where the, you know, the terrorist comes in. And um, a lot of uh, what has happened with anti-colonial movements a lot of the time is that a lot of colonized people, we have uh, bought into this idea that, you know, when we're told that we're not human, we buy into the idea that there is this human that we need to aspire to. So then we try to get those, the oppressor to uh, recognize us as human. And so then that, this is a lot of assimilationist moves. And that's why I have those yellow arrows where we try to assimilate in. But what ends up happening with that is the, is that we end up just replicating this because then we have to differentiate ourselves between others. So for example, we get the good immigrant versus the bad immigrant, the good black person versus the bad black person, rather than saying this whole framework is really messed up. Why do we have to rank ourselves in each other in this way? And um, so then what happens is in terms of the nation state and that system is that, uh, only those within the human category are allowed to uh, be in the club of sovereignty. And so I have this grid there to show that they're the ones that are allowed to cut the world and own it. Um, and so uh, what, what happens then is that with Israel-Palestine, since the peace process, Palestinians have thought that they're going to be equal sovereign side by side with Israel. And so they keep insisting, where's the border? Where's the border of our, of our, of our new state? And Israel refuses 
the to have that conversation in a genuine way. And I argue that the border already exists for Israel and the border is the line between the human and the non-human and uh, that Palestinians aren't within that uh, that club of recognition where they could be possible sovereigns uh, with uh, Israel side by side. And uh, drawing from anti-colonial thinkers like Franz Fanon, we see people who say, like him, the whole problem is this entire framework, is the, is the way that we relate to each other in terms of these measures of value over uh, who, is, um, who, is, who is valuable and who is not. And so then this is why um, I, look at, I look at maps. I love looking at maps from people from below. And this is like uh, on Google Earth, this is the article, Joseph, that you assigned, uh, where I looked at how refugees, they map in ways that end up causing a lot more um, powerful discourses to continue being alive about the creation of Israel itself through uh, Google Earth. And I'm happy to talk more about that in Q&A. There's also an appropriation of the map, even if it's a colonial map. This is a, a photo of a map in a refugee camp that has all of historical Palestine there, not just Gaza and the West Bank. This was in the, uh, taken in 2010, 2011. And then um, also maps of, and I'll, and I'll finish with this one. This is a map of a camp. I worked with a refugee camp when I was living in Palestine. And this is a refugee camp that is right up against this uh, apartheid wall. Uh, and it has like these black, these black dots are sniper towers. And uh, I was asked by the camp residents to map it. We had a lot of conversations about the dangers of that, but you know, we settled on strategically, it could be really important. So here I got, I was able to smuggle a, a high density aerial shot, which only Israel is allowed to take, but then sells them on the market. And I was able to um, acquire it, smuggle it into the, in, and give it to the camp. And then from there, I was able to then create a map. Here's a, a view of that wall that I was talking about from the rooftops of the of the camp. Uh, and this is from the from when you're in the camp, this is what you see. And over yonder beyond this, uh, the olive orchard, this like Jerusalem is this way. And and this is near Bethlehem, where the camp is. and. Uh, Palestinians are just no longer allowed to go to Jerusalem anymore. This wall is in the way. But anyway, getting back to then the mapping and where I think that um, I learned from Palestinians themselves that the map itself is not the problem. The map can be a tool. Uh, and so uh, here is I started to map the camp. And just as an example of different ways of mapping that um, that don't need a uh, a professional cartographer because what I found in so much of my work is that this professionalization of struggle is a is a massive problem and in particular like since with the Palestinian movement entering the peace process what happened is with it with it with the struggle itself is that it went from being a very popular struggle where women children elderly everybody was able to participate where now it becomes the project of the professionals, the cartographers, the political advisors, those people in the negotiations that are going to decide uh, the future for Palestinians rather than Palestinians themselves on the ground, everyone deciding it. So what I like to you know, talk about is like, well, you know, here are, from my point of view as a professional cartographer, this is how I would map Ida Camp streets. I don't know Ida Camp very intimately. And so I'm not even sure if these streets are all that correct? So I I ask a resident from the camp, hey, can, can Nadal, can you check my streets? Do they look okay? He says yes, but you know the rooftops are also streets. Whenever we're under curfew, we use the rooftops to jump and uh, to give each other food and information. And so I asked him to draw that map, and this is what he drew: the rooftops as streets, and which I argue is is just as uh, an accurate map as the one that, that I made and is actually one that is far more intimate and knows space and creates space in ways that a professional cartographer like myself or anyone from the outside would not be able to do. So I'm, I'll leave it there so we can have a lot, uh, more Q&A because I think I've gone 40 minutes instead of 30 minutes and I hope that's okay. Um, but I'm happy to, uh, to show more slides or, or, or talk, talk more or listen more, anything that you like. So let me stop sharing here.
Thank you very much, Hiki. That was wonderful. I read, I heard you speak about your research before in grad school, but never in this particular way that I've seen other things that you haven't mentioned before. So really such an eye-opening thing for me, um, and I'm sure the others do. At this point, I was wondering if there are some questions uh, from the audience or any kind of stories or, or um, maybe parallel examples of how the Israel-Palestine Palestine situation mirrors some societies that you know, maybe the Philippines, maybe uh, another example of it. Uh, maybe I'll begin, Kiki, by asking you this question because I was so fascinated by that map that was drawn by an insider in, in camp, Ida Camp Streets. And, um, uh, here in the Philippines, for example, uh, and, and as many of the audience could also provide more uh, articulations, is we have a community pantry. Uh, this is a kind of Kropotkin's idea of mutual sharing, where people actually bring food vegetables, fruits, whatever, to other people who are in need. And this happened only in, in the light of uh, the COVID-19 lockdown, as well as the rather um, uh, strict, and that's a big understatement, strict um, uh, go governance of the current president of this country. So people started giving each other those kinds of things. And I was reminded by, the, by those stories you have about rooftop uh, streets, as uh, spaces of subversion and spaces of, of clandestine network of people in order to provide for, their, for themselves where uh, governments cease to um, provide them with what should actually go to them. So maybe, I don't know if you can respond to that, maybe a little bit more elaboration about those rooftops, street, uh, yeah, thank you so much for that. Actually, it was a lot of my um, a lot of my outlook and relation with Palestine was precisely trying to highlight uh, the you know these these processes and and by that I mean that the world of, when I talk about the world of 1492, I talk about the imposition of a world, the imposition of a logic, of a worldview, of a philosophy that that for example, it splits, this is something very central to the modern world is that it splits the, it splits, well, it doesn't, it, it doesn't know how to respect difference. What it knows how to do very well is rank difference. And we learn this in school uh, when we're ranked as a good student or bad student, A, B, C grades, F grades. Uh, we learn this um, in terms of racial hierarchies, just skin color then just becomes ranked rather than just respected as different, it becomes ranked. And so what the world of 1492 has done, because especially because of the colonial powers is impose this way of thinking all over the world in places where other worldviews exist. And some of those worldviews and those worlds, I call them, and many scholars call them, uh, those many of those worlds have been extinguished, and this is what happened with the genocide of a lot of native peoples. But there are still many worlds that continue to exist. Where, for example, and this is very prevalent in Asia, is like it is in Africa and the Americas with native peoples. Is, for example, the yin and the yang, the idea of balance and the idea of fluidity between two things rather than binarism between of, of two things. And so there's been this imposition of a world where then power has to be imposed from the top. And then we on the bottom and below, we become convinced that we don't create space, that we don't, that we don't, that we don't create the world. And so what I wanted to do with Palestine is um, get to know it more and, and, and highlight for myself so I could learn how it is that a movement uh, can, can continue existing for so long in resistance, highlight parts of those other worlds that still exist. And the rooftops, the streets, uh, I wanted to counterimpose it with mine because my kind of mapping was a very, uh, you know, the, a, a very top-down kind of mapping where I had this institutional backing as a PhD 
to impose a way, a view on Palestine. What I wanted to do, help do, is commit cartographer suicide, like Amakal Cabral class suicide, <laughs> uh, by showing that people there know space very well. They create space all of the time. And the rooftops and streets is a way to highlight these other, these exercises of power, these communal exercises of power, it's like the mutual aid uh, practices that you're talking about. That, you're, that a lot, we saw crop up all over the world with the with all of the lockdowns, and as another really quick example of worlds that continue to exist, and sadly that this is how many of them die, uh, is uh, so olive trees. Israel quite quite regularly uproots olive trees that have been in Palestinian families for centuries, if not millennia. And when, and when you hear it from the outside, you hear this as a crime, that's the property of Palestinians and Israel just goes and destroys them. But then when you go on the ground, you hear that Palestinians, Palestine, Palestinians do not, most Palestinians do not think of olive trees as private property. They think of them as family members. But the thing is, if they're gonna try to get support and sympathy from the West, the West doesn't really know what it means to treat a tree like a family member. Like nature is supposed to be an object for domination of hum by humans. And so in order to get sympathy from the West, a lot of Palestinian activists and scholars will use the discourse of the olive trees are private property because that's, that's what's sacred to the West is private property rather than life. And so then uh, a problem happens where many Palestinians start believing that olive trees are private property and they forget that there are other ways of relating to olive trees. And so then those worlds become extinguished more and more when we adopt the imposition of one world uh, and, and think that other worlds that exist are either backward or um, or uh, terrorist worlds, uh, or they just don't even exist anymore. So then we we don't get have that imagination that the world could be otherwise, where many worlds can fit. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? I, there's one right here. Let me just read it for you. Contending narratives and memories affect their thought of imagined community by Benedict Anderson. Do you think Orientalism has influenced greatly maps about Palestine? Yeah, so the idea of Orientalism, which uh, very famously was put forward by a Palestinian scholar named Edward Said, um, I think it was very, uh, very powerful in creating our, our geographic imaginations, which is something that Derek Gregory, another geographer, recently uh, took up in the, in the early 2000s, in that, um, the West was able, the, the West was created a map, created maps that uh, made, made themselves believe that the world was a certain way, where um, in, in the case of Palestine, that the land existed and nobody else existed there, that the native people who existed were really just props. Uh, uh, from like, you know, as if they were like playing out some theatrics from antiquity and that the land was empty. So you get this, this discourse of um, Israel making the desert bloom uh, and, and it just makes invisible the people there because what ends up being important from the, the perspective of colonizers is uh, strategic territories, resources and, and those kinds of things. So yeah, Orientalism has greatly influenced these maps, these maps on Palestine because the idea is that um, the people there, if they do exist, they really don't know anything. They, and even that they don't know very much that they need help from the West to become civilized. And that even happens within the Palestinian leadership itself too, because it didn't have maps for a very long time. Israel had maps. And in fact, in the Oslo peace process, the Palestinian leadership was signing maps that Israel produced. The Palestinian movement didn't have a mapping outfit like it does now. And so it blames itself like, oh, we were so backward. We didn't have maps. But my argument is like, why would you need, you don't need maps when you know the landscape. Like, and you're not backward because you don't have maps. Maps are a, a tool uh, for specific, that, that arise when societies need them and Palestinians 
didn't need them. They were mapped now, and then they did need them in Oslo um, because it was not very wise for them to be signing Israeli maps. Um, but you know, it, 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 the, the thing about modern maps is that it becomes a marker over whether you are a modern subject, if you're intelligent, if you know, uh, rather than being understood as just a tool for liberation, it becomes the idea becomes that those who can um, make you legible on a map will decide if you should have some kind of liberation or self-determination. Uh, there's another article that you did, which some of my students here uh, read about how Google Earth itself was uh, almost like returned, uh, a term that was used for the situation is to um, somehow make it work for them in terms of claiming certain territories. And we have um, some examples of that here too. When, so, so Kiki, you're, you may be aware of the South China Sea, West Philippine Sea uh, problematic uh, that's going on right now, and the open street map uh, would usually claim those disputed waters as either you know China or the Philippines, and then it gets changed every hour, even. So there's a semantic war on signs that's going on. But uh, what was interesting was that people keep on changing them depending on who gets to go there. So it's it's a fantastic display of these kinds of of cartographies that 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 somehow. If they cannot fight their war for real, they would do it semantically or through maps. That representation is everything. So, so anyway. Oh, there's another question. Okay, go, go ahead. Well, just just on that point, I think that it's you know, when Google Maps came out and Google Earth. There's been so many of these disputes over borders. Like, is Kashmir part of India or is it Pakistan? And I thought it was so fascinating, and I think it's important to keep highlighting these battles because it makes the map no longer seem a historical and, and normal in our lives. Like we see that there's all of these power struggles that take place in these borders and these boundaries and just naming for place names and keeping, keeping that alive, highlighting, and this is what I try to do with that article is to highlight that Hey, none of this is a given. None of it. None of this is inevitable. There's all of these power struggles, and and we're a lot more powerful than even we think, even if we're not in the in those halls of power. Right. Uh, Kiki, there's another question here for you. Did you have a chance to check or map the situation of Palestinians living in refugee camps in other Middle Middle East countries, especially Lebanon, uh, Jordan, others? Yeah, that's such a great question. I did not have a chance to check or, or map the situation of Palestinians in refugee camps in other countries. And Lebanon is a very important place. I have, I have, a, I have great friends that, that do work in the camps there. I have not had the honor of visiting the camps. Uh, I was very, I visited Lebanon and I visited Jordan, but I'm very careful in, in entering a camp um, and, and enter it by permission and, um, and uh, even just the question of maps, I was very hesitant with Ida Camp to even map. They found out I was a geographer and they asked me to map and I told them no. <laughs> like, no, maps, maps have ruined everything. You don't want a map, you know? And they're like, they're like, well, we need a map. Israel already has all the maps and we don't. And it ended up being very helpful because uh, the base map that I created was the first one that was created of the camp. And then from there, they were able to fix water issues and now have urban gardens on the rooftop and stuff. Um, but 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 I did not have the honor of going into um, and getting to know other camps in other in other parts of of other neighboring countries. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's a really great question. Thank you. I I was remembering one of your stories before when you entered the border and they know you're American and then and then they ask you all sorts of questions and you answered, well, I want to study church history, which is kind of like uh, something that they uh, phenomenologically would understand as something they would let you in. But if they realize that more than that, it's probably even a critique of the whole thing, they would not yeah. have allowed you. <laughs> I had to get a visa renewed and I was gonna get kicked out of the country and, but I ended up getting my visa completely by telling the truth. And it was a truth I never imagined that I would be living is that I was interested in Napoleon. Like I didn't, I didn't care about Napoleon before, but that dude like was really important in the history of modern mapping of Palestine. 
and then and also when I moved to Palestine I was like this everyone says this is a religious conflict but it's a political conflict I don't I'm, and, and I don't care I don't want to know anything about religion and then it turned out I had to read the Bible <laughs> to understand what was going on in these map makers minds when it came to it and so I, I understand now that politics and religion are not separate um, are, are, not, are not separate the way in the university, the disciplines, they separate them. There's there's a lot of things that are intertwined in them. But yeah, right. it, was, it was really funny. Like you end up studying things in your entire life you never thought that you were going to study, but they become so fascinating and are part of the creation of the world. There's another question here from Eileen. Um, uh, the, I, I, I don't know if you recall some of the things you said in your, in your article on when the Cairo tree is the border, uh, for those of you who are I'm not familiar with it. Um, in your Carob Tree essay, you did come clean about the professional academic becoming caught in the grip of survivalism, preserve ourselves as a medi mediating class, is how you put it. I'm wondering if you could expand on that given your post challenge to binarisms. Perhaps if you could speak about the mapping, not just about mapping from above and below, but from the, medi from the mediating position. I sense there is some possibility of occupying shifting positions, assuming that the geographer keeps trying to be reflexive and keeps agile in carving out space for the work like you did with the visa rationale. Well, thank you so much, Eileen, for that question and for reminding me of that. Yeah, I was, uh, there is, yeah, as an academic, uh, a lot of the time we are um, trained as, as academics uh, or UN workers or, or, or workers of any of these uh, traditionally colonial institutions. And, you know, coming from the United States, it's a very academia, very colonial institution in the West. We do, um, you know, everybody under capitalism, because we've been stripped of land and other possibilities that land allows, we have to now sell our labor in order to make money in order to buy things that we need to, to survive, to live, water, food, shelter, all of that security. And so then when we're doing work, anti-colonial work, uh, and we're in these institutions, especially how I was in the United States, um, our political commitments become entwined with our needing to survive and to have money and to have a job. And so then what ends up happening a lot of the time, and I saw this a lot in Palestine with uh, people from the EU and from uh, US or Canada who come working with NGOs, non-governmental non organizations or the United Nations, uh, where they're really just there to um, end up meet, uh, mitigating rather than accompanying and resistance anti-colonial struggles. They, they go there to mitigate, to like either like raise awareness or to uh, make the situation, like to reduce harm in some way. And all of that is very, very important. But what ends up happening is unless we actually join a, 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 like an actual anti-colonial movement, we end up just uh, mostly being rewarded to preserve ourselves as a mediating class or as a mitigating class, either one. And um, the way that I was, a I was not able to reconcile that contradiction in my life in academia in the United States, where I had political commitments. Uh, and at the same time, I was a scholar and I was being taught that I'm supposed to be outside just observing everything and reporting on it in, a, in an objective way, as if that's even possible, as if we don't live in the world, we don't exist in the world and are affected by it. And so I was not able in my case to resolve that contradiction without leaving the university, and which is what I did. And so now I accompany movements, I'm part of movements, and it's in that space where I'm able to truly uh, understand that the map can be a tool. It can be a tool, but that, that tool is something that its use needs to be determined by a movement. Is this going to help our bigger liberation strategy or is it weakening it? Because the map isn't necessarily good and it's not necessarily bad. 
Uh, it depends. It depends on the context, but it needs that decision needs to be made by those in a struggle using a very uh, as part of their strategy, understanding the difference between strategy and tactics. And um, and then in that way, as someone who's trained as a scholar, I'm able then to use those tools that I learned in the university of, of research, for example, of critical theory. I'm able to use those tools on behalf of struggle in a lot in a more effective way than having my livelihood intertwined in it. So the jobs that I have now are removed from academia. Some of them have been just working clerical work and like after I clock out, then I do the more interesting stuff outside in my life and my job usually doesn't care. They don't ask and I don't tell. They, they like the work that I do and they don't want to know anything about what I think about the world. And I love that, which I never thought I would say because I had been so thankful with academia that, wow, I get to do, I get to get paid for doing this political work that I love. Uh, and so then, and, and, but then it ended up being that I was self-censoring because the people that I was being made accountable to, my peers were other academics and not Palestinians, not people in struggle themselves. Uh, but, you know, I, what I, when I defended my dissertation, a couple of months later, I went back to Palestine in another refugee camp. I presented my dissertation and I felt that that was my true defense because I was presenting my research to the people there that I had been, uh, I had been uh, living with, doing this work with. And usually that doesn't happen in academia. You're accountable not to, to people that you live with or that you're studying struggles about. You're accountable to other people who are so removed from it. So in my case, I was not able to reconcile that contradiction without leaving the university. But I have seen some people who are able to do it effectively, but it's, it's, it's rare, but it is possible. Um, thank you very much. That was, um, I remember we had this conversation about some radicals in our group, you know, they want to be in the university and use that. And others are really leaving the university so they could do this anti-colonial struggles and many other things. And, and to me, that is very inspiring, despite being usurped by the neoliberal university that I am in at the moment. Uh, anyway, there was this one comment earlier from, from uh, that individual who asked you about mapping in Lebanon and Middle East countries. Just want to express my support to your work as someone who served in some of those camps from the Israeli side. I completely support the effort to bridge toward a solution by a better understanding of the land and equality based equality based mapping wow what's what that's wonderful too thank you sar uh, the, and then uh, eileen they said thank you very much for your candor uh, kiki this is stuff i am losing sleep over all the time drawing much energy from your writing thanks for the nudge with the essays and this talk joseph uh, maybe this is our existential juncture as well <laughs> Uh, Eileen teaches art studies, by the way, in the university, but she's uh, auditing my class uh, this semester yeah. on counter mapping. So they're reading some Dennis Wood. <laughs> the white Yay, guy. Dennis Wood. Uh, and uh, JB Harley and all that. So it's a wonderful experience for me. Are there any questions at some point? Um, just to remind everyone, it's 3.30 a.m. where Kiki is in California, but just game for another question. Um, to Joseph, yes. Yes, please. Um, Dr. Kiki Vick, um, thank you so much for your very enlightening um, presentation. I pretty much relate with um, your realizations and reflections on um, how maps and worldviews are um, intertwined. Um, and so maybe I do just like to take this opportunity to also share my experience as a cartographer and as a mapper um, who also started from the academe being a student of geography and then um, I had the opportunity at that time as a relatively young at that time master student um, because I had this chance to work with land rights advocates and anthropologists who at that time were few of the people or groups of people who would appreciate geography because at that time our, our discipline, our course was not that popular or um, among, among other um, people outside from, from, from our group. And so um, having started in that kind of work, we, uh, I was part of a group that assisted um, indigenous groups um, in different parts of the country. 
in collating and um, putting together maps and spatial information that was a requirement of the government uh, in, ter- in relation to claiming land rights for ancestral domains. And so um, in that process, I, I be- at first it was quite difficult because, you know, I was technically trained um, to look at maps and think of maps as something that requires um, technical expertise and accuracy and required a lot of training to be able to, um, to you know, um, to, to be able to, to map and for your map to be sort of credible. Um, but I also, through my work, um, working with non-government organizations from that time on, realized how important it is uh, to also understand local context and practices and to really go deeper into spatial knowledge of, of different um, people coming from different perspectives. And so I sort of relate to that uh, role of kind of being a mediator in, in that process. But then also, um, you know, eventually being mature uh, in relation to understanding, you know, that you also have a political agenda when it comes to these kinds of practices. And that uh, in, in many ways, you know, you kind of also shift really um, depending on, I guess, um, the kind of av- advocacy that you are um um, engaged in because that could also change because you know um, so many there are so many purposes and utilities of the map and so many groups and so many uh, advocacies are, are would be interested in 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 uh, mapping and in creating spatial information or, and therefore also parang um, exploring spatial knowledge of different groups of people coming from um, with different worldviews and perspectives so. Um, I also realized in 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 that process na um, we really need to also as mappers and practitioners in the field collaborate and also um, try to to reach out um, to other people involved in other kinds of advocacies to further enrich our experience uh, because really maps are very powerful tools. And it's part of our practice to always reflect and think about how it would impact um, 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 the lives of other people, especially those who are marginalized. So thank you very much for, for all of the reflections that you have shared. Thank you so thank much you. for that. I, I really hear that in, in terms of when I think about uh, knowledge production and, and, and the definition of maps that um, I critique, I mean, I critique all, all maps and, and for me, critique is just highlighting what the assumptions are uh, of things. It doesn't mean that I love it or I hate it or anything like that. But um, this question of, of, of knowledge with modernity, with the modern world, science, scientific knowledge is what has taken center. Like there isn't really a lot of room in the, in the dominant modern world for other types of knowledges. And so when I talk about scientific knowledge and the, the, the modern map is as the map, science is just, if it's scientific, it means that it can be replicated because it's, you know, it has a formula that can be replicated. And that's one way of knowing, but there's so many other ways of knowing and other experiences that are so unique and can never be replicated. And a lot of those are more toward the more spiritual and the, the arts, for example, I think maybe that's a, that's a distinction that we might might be useful to make with arts and sciences that art can't really be replicated in the way that you know science is and but they're still very important and valuable but um when it comes to then mapping there is a lot of focus on you know this accuracy is the map accurate and if it's not then it's not a map and that's why i wanted to to point out the rooftops of streets that's something that can't be replicated by anyone else other than the doll and even if you were to draw it again, maybe he would draw it differently because he, his memory would be a bit different about how he jumped from, from house to house. But it, it's not any less valid. It's just a, another way of knowing. And I think the you know, moving away from binaries and, and this is something that I had to learn is moving away from binaries because I was raised in a Western context by Western schools. 
you know, when I was telling the camp folks, no, let's not map. The map is evil. The map has ruined everything. I was there falling into this binary of, you know, uh, it's a colonial tool and therefore it's, it's, it's bad. Well, it's a tool and it was used by colonial powers, but it can also be a tool that can be used by resistance, just like how the shape of the, of the colonial map which frightens Israel that it's not just Gaza and the West Bank, that it's all of historical Palestine. And the Google Earth one, where the refugees mapped places they weren't supposed to be mapping anymore after the 90s, and they did. And so uh, something that, yeah, just to sum up, the importance of recognizing other ways of knowing as important, knowledge production as being key. And, and, and I think that that can really help us shift our perspective of how power functions. It doesn't just function from above on down. It's also exercised from below through our everyday practices with each other. Right, thank you. Wonderful, uh, my gosh, so many things to look into here too. Uh, Oni said something too, in my work now, I think about mapping as weaving spatial stories. I, I like how she worded it, but hopefully stories start emancipating and empowering and exploring diverse ways of knowing. If I may just take this moment, uh, as Aoni uh, um, it teaches G digital cartography in our department, and one of the things I was so impressed by her was, I, how, I hope Aoni, you don't mind me saying this, but, but um, she usually uses mapping as a way to free the students from the rigidity of it. Because there was, Kiki, there was this one time where there was this big rally in the university, about the charter change and it was it was in the university and she asked her mapping class to go there and so she could they could imagine a world based on what they heard to create maps i mean that's very that exciting to, i know that's wonderful i think only did that i haven't even thought of that but but she wonderfully was able to bring her students and think through how maps could be deployed could be use for purposes other than what it is. There is a scholar here, uh, also a, a junior faculty in another college who I am part of his committee work. And um, he, his topic is about the LUMAD mapping. LUMAD Kiki is the indigenous group here that's being marginalized by the government. And so they are traveling all over the country. They came to our university and we became the teachers. But uh, but he calls it Mapa Cuento, Mapa for map, Cuento for, for sorry. sorry. Yeah, that's right. And, and so one of the members of the, her committee said something in the, in the um, critique of his work, they said, oh, I don't like this at all because this is such a, a westernized, you know, this is a very Western kind of thing. And, and later on, when I spoke to that to the guy who was saying uh, to the student, he said, I don't think he gets it. I think. I think it's really about unmapping. He said, I'm doing unmapping using the very Cartesian coordinated georeference maps for my purpose of telling the stories of these marginalized groups. And I said, I think that that was really lost to that other professor who just basically um, reduced map as colonial uh, col extensions of colonial power. So something to be we can all learn from in using how maps and how maps can be deployed for other purposes so absolutely I, and and i had to learn that with Pal from palestinians themselves and it's it was so beautiful uh to be in relation with them in that way as my teachers too rather than me coming as the one that knows everything because they're the ones that taught me no the map is just a tool Whereas I was over here, well, the Europeans created it, so it must be evil. And that's like, that was, you know, a very reactionary way of me, of my thinking when I first started to learn about colonialism, you know, I'm, I was very angry and, uh, and I fell into that binary thinking uh, where even Europe itself has a lot of really beautiful history of struggle that we don't hear about. And um, like the United States, a lot of people all over the world, rightly so, do not ever want to visit the United States. They hate the United States. The United States is an empire. But then when they visit, they see so many contradictions here, so much struggle, so much resistance that they understand it. Like, wow, it isn't just one thing. They had fallen into this binary thinking themselves, adopting 
the categories that the West themselves have created, not just the categories, but the logic of it's either this or it's that. There is one here who um, uh, said something. Uh, Thank you very much for the insights. I'm doing my thesis on the utilization, utilization of cartography in producing poetry through the production of representational spaces based uh, on memories, experiences, and the poetics of lived spaces. That's amazing. That's beautiful. I know. Look forward uh, to seeing some of that. I know. Uh, so uh, one more thing before I finally end this, I know it's uh, 3.42 a.m. for Kiki, but I just wanted to say th one more thing and, and you don't have to respond to this, but it's wonderful for you to also uh, speak about the border that it's not just the, the artificial juridical border that we are made to understand, but it's about the human and non-human. And that is so powerful, you know, in terms of the treatment, how this this uh, European imaginary has created the non-human, and therefore became the border that separates the us and the them. I, mean, I remember when we talked about this before, how Said did mention that in his other book, not the one Orientalism, Culture and Exile, I think, where he said something about it. Really, say. It's a European invention. You <laughs> know, this whole thing is it's an invention, and people believed in it. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's an invention, and well, er, anyone can invent anything. But the problem was that they were able to impose that through through violence, the colonial powers through war, and then through forcing that as part of our education system. And so then we end up thinking, growing up, thinking that that's just normal, that that's just natural that there wasn't power struggles for that. Yeah, so, so super, super important, I think, to, to understand th that bit of it, the, um, the human and the non-human. So a lot of this work uh, that I presented today, um, especially on that diagram, is work that I have built off of my dissertation. It wasn't part of my dissertation, but it's part of my book, that I, the book that I'm writing now, and the, the new argument that I'm making. And a lot of it comes from Thinkers like Franz Fanon, who think about race, who think about the, the colonized, the colonizer, and the colonized, and how the geography is just very different um, between the two, and what police is the line is the police, you know, the the, pol the police themselves are the line that they police the line between the human and the non-human, between the colonized and the colonized, or and the border itself, depending on borders themselves on the ground, like if it's in the case of the United States and Mexico, which is two highly unequal countries where the United States is supposed to be the space of peace and Mexico is a space of war, which you see uh, dramatically play out very in very tragic ways with the, the drug with, with the drug war, where there's so much uh, consumption of cocaine and other drugs in the United States. Um, but it comes into the United States through massive war in Mexico. And so when people come to the United States from Mexico, or from Central America, it's not necessarily because they think the United States is a superior place. It's because it's a safer place. They're trying to flee violence. But then that border itself is, is a dividing line that is, uh, is between two supposedly sovereign countries, although with Mexico and the United States, the U.S. has very much colonized Mexico in more economic ways and political ways. Uh, and the border ends up serving as that that human non-human split uh, of peace and war, and so this is stuff that I that I've developed since I published my dissertation, and it'll come out in narrative form uh, uh, with my book. Yeah, like how I used something? to write. Can Remember you how I used to write, book? Joseph? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph knows I used to write in a fun way. Yeah. In a and very storytelling way. <laughs> Until graduate school, I killed that spirit from me. <laughs> but I'm going back to it now. I'm so I'm so writing glad. a book. Uh, it's called Palestine 1492. And it's about uh, my own personal process of learning about Israel and about Palestine. And it begins from when I was nine years old. Uh, the first line is, I was nine years old when I learned about the cruelty of Europe. I didn't learn it from my Native American parents or grandparents. I learned about it from Jewish history. And it was me learning about the diary of Anne Frank through a play and just being completely traumatized by the Holocaust uh, and, and being very grateful that Israel existed as a safe place for Jews following the Holocaust. But then 
but 10 years later, uh, finding out how Israel was created by the expulsion of Palestinians and then just having my heart broken all over again. And so then um, my process of the books that I read, the thinkers that really helped me out and how um, Anne Frank, I've understood her as a compañera, as someone that has accompanied me uh, on this question of justice throughout my whole life, even with Palestine, uh, where Israel would like it so that we all have this binary thinking that you can't be uh, in solidarity with the victims of the Holocaust if you're going to be in solidarity with Palestinians. And I refuse, I refuse, I refuse that, that division. So uh, I talk about the process that I went through in learning about uh, internal colonialism and with my own family and about um, some of the dissertation work that I did. And then I end by problematizing this idea of even just Europe itself being a, a homogenous thing. Um, because I've learned since then that there are lots of movements in Europe and Europe itself had to be created by like the expulsion of Jews, the expulsion of the Moors and, and Muslims. Uh, it itself had to had to extinguish a lot of other worlds that existed in Europe, but many of those worlds continue to exist. And so that's uh, after I finish this Palestine book, I'd like to uh, work on another book called uh, Another Europe. That, that highlights a lot of these things that I've learned about Europe since then. Oh, wow. Uh, be sure to let us know about it because it sounds like there's a lot of interest for that, for those narratives that you're talking about. Uh, I, I don't mind saying this to everyone, that Kiki really writes extremely well. And so one time we were joking about it in grad school where, where uh, she was able to get this, this fantastic fellowship, right? And so she worked with the best, you know, with those big cultural studies guys in her program. And then she asked me to read her, her, her work. The first thing that came to mind was that, Kiki, I don't recognize you here. You know, I, I love the old one. I love the, the one when you, you write this thing so beautifully and it flows like water. This one. Yeah. <laughs> Academia. Thank you for saying that. I'm back, Joseph. I'm back. Oh, Actually, okay. I've, I've been trying to write this Palestine book for the last three years. And I tried and it's gone through so many drafts and it was going nowhere. And I did not want to speak in the eye because I wanted to produce a book of theory for a popular audience. And a, a Palestinian friend of mine pointed out how arrogant that is. And it's very colonial to speak as if you're not part of the world, which is like completely against all of my work that I do. And it just like clicked in my mind. And on April 9th, I'll never forget that day, I wrote my first I sentence. And then I just started to cry, like the tear. It was so beautiful. It was so healing. And then ever since then, it's just been flowing. And it's, and then I was like, oh my goodness, I used to write this way. And then graduate school happened to me. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really nice. I hope I can share it with you all uh, yeah. when that one comes out. Thank you very much. There's a last comment here from Darlene. Uh, she was especially moved by the rooftop maps as uh, interesting, the rooftop maps are mental maps of survival and caring they actually reflect more of the patterns of communication interaction and how the sense of community is reinforced so that struck a chord <laughs> oh that's beautiful darling put that thank you are there any last minute questions uh, for everyone um just reminding you it's 3 50 a.m for Gigi. <laughs> i have to keep on reminding them that okay we've done so much <laughs> one things before uh, so uh, if there are any if there are no more questions about this uh if this this is now the point where we present you with um uh, the i'm waiting okay the certificate of appreciation for you for the valuable insights and expertise shared as a virtual resource speaker for the talk palestine mapping for the geography webinar colloquium series signed today of course it's, uh, it's already may 6 for you too right okay so yes. signed today, <laughs> may 2021 by yours truly and yanni lopez who was also here and the audience our chair of the department of geography so thank you very much for this is so beautiful please yeah. send this to me over email absolutely yes. and i'm going to say the word cloud too that they did that these people here uh, did when the word Palestine is mentioned. Now, just to um, for the audience, just wanted to let you know that we have two more speakers after Kiki. 
hazard scape and risk perception happens on the 14th of uh, this month at 6 p.m. this a Friday. Dr. Lou and Jelly Campo will give a talk to that. And then finally, the chair, of the, the former chair of the Department of Anthropology gives us a talk on cultural memory for DRR, uh, Dr. Solidad uh, Delisay. So uh, I hope you'll be you'll be there for those other talks. But once again, Kiki, our heartfelt thanks for you for 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 being here to talk and also at such a time when it's very difficult <laughs> but, but we want to know more about your, your projects uh, in the future so thank it's you it's been such an honor thank you all i hope to uh joseph if you can keep me abreast of people's work as it comes out because i'm sure i can learn so much oh yeah uh, absolutely and, and yeah and, and i'd love to be in touch if you know when this book comes out yeah and I hope we can make the thing happen that we used to say, which is to bring you here at some point. Oh, travel yes. restrictions are no longer a problem for the many of us. So there's a lot of thanks here for you. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, I will we'll see you all uh, 